feel free to jump in. We're glad to have you uh, aboard. We are about to do chapter, what chapter are we about to do? <laughs> Eight, posterior inference and prediction. Could ah, not, yes. Yeah, some of the images on my quarto are just uh, we're not rendering properly. They're just like super small. So I was going to show you just the markdown, but you know, I'll, I'll just go over it. And, you know, yeah, sure. It. No worries. So it won't be as snazzy as I wanted it, but I think it'll be fine. <laughs> we okay. got new people. We got another person today. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Alma, did you want to introduce yourself? I saw you You typed in that this is your first time and you've been going through the book on your own. So you're certainly welcome aboard and jump in. Um, yeah. I'm excited. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> so, yeah, my name is Alma. I'm a graduate student in Ghana. And I, I went to use base for my work. So, cause it's like all I've ever learned is sequential statistics. So it's like, okay, now this whole new thing. And I'm trying to understand what it is and how to apply it in my work. So yeah, thanks for having me. That's so cool. Wow. You said you're from Ghana, is that right? Yeah, I'm from Ghana, so yeah, it's 4 p.m. here. Wow, that's very cool. Very exciting. Welcome aboard. Oh, uh, one item of business. Yes, definitely welcome aboard. One item of business before we go further is uh, I went ahead and signed up for next week's simple normal regression. Unless somebody else had you know their heart set on doing that, if so, let me know because I always could use more bandwidth in my week. But I was going to cover that one. Cool. Yeah, that, that works for me. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm hoping after this week, my work calms down a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, but awesome. I'll, uh, here, I'm going to share my screen and then uh, you can start. Oh, hold, but also before you start, now, Amma, have sure. you been involved in the book club before? Uh, no, like I have been in the RDS. Group, but I've never been able to actually make it to a book club meeting. So, okay. Yeah, so this is my first time. This time. Wow. Very good. Well, basically the structure is that a different person will volunteer each week to go through the current chapter. There's a sign up list on the uh, Slack channel. You can see the pinned items there. And uh, it's kind of, you know, once in your week, you just do what you, you know, kind of cover the chapter the best you can. It's not expected that you're the master of the chapter or anything. It's just you're going to lead the discussion and, and people should be feel free to jump in with questions or observations or the person leading might say, hey, I didn't really understand this at all or whatever. They can certainly pause and, and look for some clarifications. And we're all just trying to learn this together here. None of us are experts by any means on any of this. So, sure. so if it's such that like a more of a facilitator because I'm pretty, pretty new to this. <laughs> all okay. my experience is sequential statistics. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Very good. All right. Sorry, uh, I interrupted you, Robert. No, not at all. Um, so, yeah, I do apologize again. I was trying to render this in uh, Quarto, but um, some of the images looked a bit wonky, and I just figured, you know, we could still present the material this way. Um, so, yeah. So, chapter we read this week was uh, chapter eight, Pastor Inference and Prediction. Um, I think, you know, I, I think in the last few chapters, right, we, we've been to obviously, you know, unit one, we were talking about, you know, conjugate priors and understanding how to um, both like form a prior and then, you know, observe some data in our likelihood and then create a posterior from that. Um, and then we've obviously been talking a little bit about uh, Monte Carlo or Markov chain Monte Carlo, right? Um, I think this is really where the chapter where we get into more about the posterior. Um, both from not only just like creating it, but also calculating things like critical intervals, uh, estimating summary statistics from it, uh, using it for prediction uh, purposes, right? Um, so I think this is like really the one chat, like the first chapter in which we're actually like doing more substantive things with the posterior. And I believe that will, you know, that's going to continue in the uh, other units. So I guess, you know, the goals for this are uh, we want to understand about uh, posterior estimation hypothesis testing and uh, well, should be prediction, not predicting, uh, prediction. Um, and we want to see how uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo can be used in uh, posterior analysis. So for the book, um, you know, the 
example that they go through is um, uh, with MoMA and Artist Age. So MoMA is the a Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, and the question is, what are the chances that, um, uh, you know, that a modern artist is uh, Gen X or even younger? Um, so we're just gonna, you know, have this little sample of data. And it seems that, you know, right here we have 14 uh, people that are Gen X or younger and 86 that aren't. Um, so the prior they start off with is a beta four six prior, you know, kind of, you know, not a particularly strong prior, right? A little bit below 0 0.5. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of should all, you know, at this point, right? Like at least in my brain, the, the, how to, how to calculate the beta posterior is like hammered into my brain. Uh, so after, you know, you just do the computation for that, uh, pretty simple, you get a beta 1892, uh, posterior and we can just plot that, right? Um, here we see our prior, um, it was again pretty vague, right? Um, after observing some data, our posterior then shifts a lot more to the left and is a lot more narrow. And we can also see, right, that the posterior looks um, very similar to the likelihood, um, which obviously means that, um, you know, the data is that we're taking our prior, and that's again looking more like the likelihood. Um, so we've you know, we've been doing this again, right, for like a lot of chapters, right? We've been have some prior, observe some data, create a posterior. Now we actually get to do more interesting things with a posterior. Um, three major things we can do with it are, uh, again, estimation, hypothesis testing, and prediction. Um, so this one, yeah, this, this is one of the examples of where this didn't render right. Um, so with posterior estimation, we, we, it, it kind of talked about in some of the beginning chapters, right? Like if I want to calculate the, you know, mean of the beta distribution, right? That's just um, alpha over alpha plus beta. Kind of forget what it is off the top of my head for mode. I think it's like alpha, it might be alpha plus, I forget. It's like alpha plus, it might be just like alpha over alpha plus beta minus two, I think. I could not be wrong on that. Um, one thing I wanted the, the to- The mean? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, the, um, what should I call it? The- um, Mode? Yeah, the mode. I think the mode is alpha plus one divided by alpha plus beta plus two or something like that you're right it's something yeah really weird. um here wait i'm gonna i think it's one it's paused that's yeah. fine um sorry about that but <laughs> in this poorly formatted image um <laughs> awesome from it's from the book right at the beginning of posterior, posterior estimation so again my apologies for not being formatted uh, properly um they show uh the I believe it's white right the posterior for like people who had two different priors right um and when they calculated the mean, it was like pretty much this similar, right? I think it was something around like, I think it was actually about like 16%. Um, but if you can kind of look at these distributions, uh, the one on the right is a lot more wide, um, where there's a lot more uncertainty, right? About um, what proportion of artists are Gen X or younger, whereas to the distribution on the left, um, although it has the same uh, central tendency as, um, the distribution on the right, it's a lot more narrow, right? So we're a lot more certain uh, about uh, what pi is on the left side of the distribution compared to the right the right uh, distribution, uh, which is something, you know, I kind of wanted just to bring up in the sense that um, even if let's say you have, right, like the same mean, the distributions could look completely different, right? And that tells a different story, right? If I'm, that I'm just calculating a really basic, you know, summary statistic like the mean, right, for a beta distribution. Um, so then this gets into uh, credible intervals. What I love about credible intervals is how uh, you would interpret them, like how everyone wrongly interprets confidence intervals, right, in the frequentist, um, uh, you know, thinking of statistics, right? The, the frequent, everyone says, you know, the confidence interval, um, they're actually, what they're defining incorrectly is like what actually a credible interval is, right? Because Confidence intervals are just like if I say 95% confidence interval on mu, what I'm really saying is right that like 95, uh, let's say 100 confidence intervals will contain the true parameter mu, right? Whereas with a posterior credible interval, I'm saying that we are 95% certain um, that, um, that like the parameter of interest in this case, you know, working with pi is between, you know, these bounds. Uh, so we can calculate that pretty simply in R. We just use the Q, Q beta function, Q standing for quantile. Um, we're just doing right here a middle 95% uh, credible interval of our beta 1892 posterior. So what this means is that um, we are 95% certain that uh, pi is between, you know, 10% and like 23.79%. 
Um, we obviously aren't necessarily bound by just using a 95% credible interval. Um, we can use any type of level we want, right? 10, 20, here's an example of one or 50. Um, so we're saying that we're 50% confident that um, the proportion of artists that are uh, Gen X or younger is between 13.8% and 18.6%. Um, so we, you know, different ways to like, you can use different types of credible uh, levels, but you're not bound to 95. Um, so hypothesis testing, we can also do that as well. So I, hypothesis testing, right? The um, big thing in frequentist statistics, um, you know, you have your null hypothesis, you have your alternative. Uh, we can do the same thing with here in the, uh, with uh, Bayesian statistics. So as an example, we can ask um, questions like, what is the posterior probability that Gen Xers account for fewer than 20% of um, modern art museum artists? Um, so we can use the P beta function. I believe P would stand for, but I'm pretty sure just probability. Um, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, so we can, you know, just answer that question pretty easy, right? We have our parameters of beta, and then we can say, oh, well, it's about 84.89%. Um, like that's a posterior probability that Gen Xers count for less than 20% of, um, you know, modern art museums. Um, and that's, this is an example, right? Just like a one-sided test where our null hypothesis is that pi is greater than or equal to uh, 20%. And our alternative is just that it's less than 20%. Um, obviously, then you could also do stuff like two-sided tests. I didn't really show that there. I think um, a lot of us have you know been exposed to frequent statistics. So like we know about the one-sided tests and two-sided tests. Um, but it is nice to know you can obviously do that um, with um, you know, Bayesian statistics, and it also feels a lot more interpretable, right? Um, I would say compared to the frequentist uh, point of view. Um, any questions so far? I, I'm obviously you know, going to continue, but if anyone wants to like ask any questions, you know, jump in, you know, feel free. I, I had a quick, yeah, I do have a quick question. I, yeah. Does it, does anyone know? I'll, I'll know which I can never remember the uh, the secret decoder ring on the R distribution functions. There's like a D beta, P beta, Q beta, and R beta, right? So yep. R beta, I think, is the one that gives you random variance. Yep. And I think P beta is actually the cumulative probability distribution. As we can say, right? Let's do P beta. I, so I, yeah, I always am like P beta is it's close to okay. uh, it is density, distribution, quantile, and random. So I say Q is quantile, D is so D, when they say distribution, they actually mean cumulative though, right? Is that what they mean? Uh, like p beta is zero is uh is zero right <laughs> well i guess it would still be zero yeah okay let's just do it for you know what this might be easier for you let's say let's do i mean and yeah you're right also says d beta gives a density and b p beta gives yeah. this as well i guess it gives, it's d yeah it gives a distribution function is that just a known thing in statistics distribution function means cumulative distribution function rather than i think or, think <laughs> i'm actually not entirely sure okay I well mean, like, yeah yeah i don't know i don't want to i don't want to um i'm not yeah i'm actually not not particularly sure it's funny the help doesn't actually just say straight up like yeah like just gives you the distribution function maybe that's the uh, you know this comes from my weird background that i don't know that. <laughs> yeah i guess I okay will. I looked up I, distribution function means cumulative distribution cumulative. function. Okay, right cool. There. Awesome. Because I always think of distribution yeah. like a probability distribution function. A PDF is actually yeah. what they would call here a density. A density, yeah. yeah so it's okay. like if it like starts with D, then it's the PDF. Um, okay. Gotcha. P Thank you. is in the cumulative. Awesome. No, actually, that was helpful for me too, because I always like sometimes have to like do the help pages and like, let's yeah. just do it again or the arguments. <laughs> um, right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So, um, we can also do things with, uh, you know, in, in the spirit of hypothesis testing, we can compute stuff like the posterior odds. So um, for the posterior odds right here, we have the probability that the alternative hypothesis given that we've observed 14 successes um, over the null hypothesis given that we've observed um, 14 successes, this gives you 5.62. So we're saying that um, the alternative hypothesis is 5.62 higher odds than the null hypothesis. Odds are always weird to me. Um, so I hopefully I 
stated that correctly. Um, but it's just like other things, right, that you can kind of just look at like the strength, right, of your, um, of the alternative hypothesis after you've observed some data comparing it to the null. Uh, you do the same thing with prior odds, right? It's just alternative over the null. Um, the one thing, um, let's correct this, is the, um, the Bayes factor. So the Bayes factor is just the ratio um, of the posterior odds, right, that we calculated above here and the prior odds. Um, and in the book, they'll say that if the base factor is equal to one, that means that um, nothing has changed after you've observed um, data. Um, and in the case of if it's uh, greater than one, that means there is more evidence uh, that the alternative hypothesis is, is uh, you know, more credible, right, than the null hypothesis. And if it's less than one, that actually indicates, you know, it's more in favor of the null hypothesis, right, after you observe some data. To be completely honest, I don't intuitively understand this in the sense that, like, I understand the computation, right, right? It's just posterior odds over prior odds. I get that. But I guess I, I don't necessarily see the utility of it. I'm not sure if any of you guys had different thoughts on it. I, if um, I could volunteer my observation on this, sure. I, I've seen this in, in other contexts in the, the this this uh, posterior odds over the prior odds is actually uh, it, if you work out the math is actually equal to the likelihood ratio so it doesn't actually require you to know the prior or the posterior to calculate the base factor it just kind of so what it indicates is what you will learn from your experiment in some sense right okay so it's it's kind of like a power factor like if the base factor is one then you're not gonna learn anything from that from your observations if the base factor is like a yeah. thousand you're going to improve your you know, your posterior odds by a factor of a thousand, which is great, you know? Okay. God, so like a, a more of a way to like quantify yeah. how your understanding has like shifted. Change, yeah, changed, yeah. Okay. That's so actually, if, you're, if your prior yeah. odds were like, oh, I think the odds that I have uh, COVID is one in a thousand, then I take a test, it's got a, you know, a base factor of 10. It's not great, but <laughs> it's changed my odds somewhat, right? But the yeah. base factor like, a thousand and the odds are even that I have COVID after that test. That's a huge, that's a very powerful test type thing. Got it. Okay. Actually, like that, that I like, I, I didn't feel like in the book, it just like, here it is. And I'm like, I, I kind of know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but that, I like that. Um, so another cool thing, you know, last, obviously then we're going to, you know, posterior prediction, then MCMC. Um, we can use our posterior to actually do predictions on, you know, and newer samples of data. Uh, two things though to consider um, that are important when we're doing no predictions is uh, sampling variability in the data, right? So if we take uh, in the book, they're saying, what if we get another sample of 20 artists, right? Um, it is unlikely that um, that sample will mirror the sample that we have previously observed of 100 artists, right? Um, so there is, you know, some sampling variability in that. So that is something to account for when we're doing predictions. And then also um, posterior variability in pi. So obviously, when we um, have been doing all, all the stuff the last few chapters, we create a posterior distribution of some parameter of interest and for beta, right? It's pi. Um, but since it's a distribution, it can reasonably range from, let's say, I don't know, let's just give an example, like, um, actually, maybe I have it above here, uh, right? So like our posterior here above um, with our 1892 uh, posterior, um, what, that's like five to let's say 26, just kind of eyeballing it, right? So that's like the plausible values um, that, Pi could take. Obviously, like you can, you know, say like, oh, this is the most likely value, or this is like the least likely value. But right, like we do have to also account for that um, that this distribution does have variance, and so the parameter right could vary um, as well. It's not just you know you calculate some just that's like, this is what pi is. Like it can reasonably range from like the range defined in that posterior. Um, so that's you know something to consider. They go into a bit more of like how you can obviously calculate the math and like the probability mass function, but we can just use uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo to kind of you know do that. And especially once we get to more complicated things um, like with regression. I know Ron's going to be taken next week, and like hierarchical models and all of that. We're just going to be you know defaulting to Markov chains. Um, so this is just you know from the book where. Um, you know, we're, we're just going to do this in Stan. Um, that was really quick. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're, we're just going to do some simulations. Um, 
in our in our data is you know from zero to 100 uh, pi can range from zero to one and our model right we're saying that y follows a binomial distribution with probability pi and and is this case 100 right or number of uh, samples then we're saying that pi follows a beta distribution with a uh, alpha is four and six is beta um, and then after that you know we want to obviously do some um, diagnostic checks to actually make sure that um, everything is good. So obviously, you know, we were talking about trace plots, I want to say two chapters ago. Um, this looks like white noise for all the chains. So good, you know, it doesn't seem like there's any uh, problems. Here we're getting um, a, you know, the posterior estimate right of pi for our different chains. Um, so you can you know, just see that. And then we also want to look at the autocorrelation um, of um, for the parameters, right? So we're seeing that it's dropping off uh, pretty quickly. So there's not any um, autocorrelation, right? In like the Markov chain values for each um, for each chain, right? We want to see that you know quickly decrease. Oh, um, I see you have raised your hand. I didn't know that could be done. <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> Hi. So um, I know before you get into this nitty gritty, what is the like a question that we were trying to answer with the posterior prediction, like in terms of like a question, like how the first one, there was the question about the Gen X. Like, yeah, so that's actually, you, you, it's the same exact about. question. Yeah, so this okay. is the same exact question. So I guess maybe I should be a bit more specific. So obviously um, with the beta distribution, right, it has, um, right, the beta binomial conjugate prior, um, you can, calculate the uh, beta posterior easily, right? If I observe mm -hmm. some data from binomial, I'll just say the posterior becomes what? It's like beta alpha plus the number of successes and then mm -hmm. uh, beta plus um, number of failures. And we can just, we can just, you know, compute that analytically, right? We don't have to um, resort to Markov chain Monte Carlo because we can express uh, the posterior distribution like pretty easily. Um, this is just an example of, it's still the same exact question that I had said above, like what percent of um, MoMA artists are Gen Xers uh, or younger. Rob, could I just oh, interrupt yeah. you? I think actually sure. may have, I'm not sure, but you know, may have conflated a couple of things. So there, there is a separate question about posterior prediction, mm -hmm. right? Like posterior prediction in and of itself is, just, hey, what predict a new value? You know, now that I've done this, right? I, one, a lot of times what we use our models for is to predict, predict, for prediction, right? To predict a new value. Here, given a new X, what's your new prediction for Y type of thing, right? Or given another sample, like you said, if I were to take another sample of 20 voters, what would I, what do I expect to get? What is my prediction? That's posterior prediction. And you can do that with the, uh, with, um, and they do in the book, they do that with the conjugate prior as well. Now you're doing posterior uh, using Monte Carlo Markov chain, right? My posterior simulation is being used to answer all three of these types of questions. You know the you know the estimations, the hypothesis test, and prediction. That's I think there's a there's the word posterior and other words shoved together happens a lot in this chapter, and I've also found it a little bit confusing at times. But yeah. posterior simulation is something different from posterior prediction. Yeah, does that, yeah. Does that makes sense to everybody. I hope that. Everybody, yeah. I hope I make. I hope I added clarity and not obscurity. <laughs> no, I think you did. But I think like yeah, it, this is still like the same exact question, right? We're just doing it. We're just approaching it with. Yes, that's true. You know, the, you're the same model, right? Yeah. The yeah. same three three things we're going to want to do with it, right? Estimation, yep. uh, hypothesis testing, and prediction. Yep. So. Okay. Yeah. Um. But you mentioned a part that if you take a new sample of artists, you want to see whether you also get 20% Gen X in, like, in that new sample. Or did I um, misunderstand? Can you, that can, can you repeat that? that? Yeah. That I think it's like that question. could happen. But I think that the particular posture prediction example that they gave was given a, another sample of 20 artists, what can I expect? So that the answer to that question is actually a distribution of possibilities. It's going to be a random because yeah. of the two factors. One, the sampling probability, right? You know, you're doing a binomial sample of 20. And the other variability is the fact that the pi, the probability is also not that well known. We've improved our knowledge of pi 
through our previous experiment, we still don't know it that well. So we have to combine both of those to make a prediction with, with uncertainties on it. Yeah. Which okay, is- Okay, thank you. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's, it's still not clear, but it's, it's getting clearer of like what the different things you can do with, yeah. No, that's, I how, agree. that's how it works. We just keep getting things clear as time goes on. I feel. Yeah, <laughs> I, I hope agree. it's always good to at least make progress in that direction. No, sometimes I feel like I take two steps backward though too sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no, sometimes you're just like, I don't know. I feel like even the more I read about this, it's like some things will like break in my brain where I'm yeah, just like, wait, same. do I actually know this? And then going forward, I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay, this is actually a bit more clearer. Um, like, I don't know, the actually exercises in this chapter are, help a lot i only did yeah. like one subset but pick one of the projects that they use and they applied like the climate change ones the one i did there's also one based on penguins go through those exercises it's really really helpful yeah um thank you that's actually because i've been, actually been doing this a little bit at work and i remember i was um it didn't really sink into me that really what we're doing right it's like our data follows some sort of distribution but we're really we're estimating parameters and for some reason that didn't like sink into my brain until like two weeks ago and I'm like oh okay that makes like way more sense like what we're actually <laughs> doing um because like you know you think like oh yeah it's like we're something about the data but it's like no what you're really doing is you're putting priors on parameters and then obviously those get fed into whatever distribution like you think your data follows right um but I don't know that's like something that you know even though I was like doing right and like I kind of understand what's going on but like it didn't sink into me uh, for until a couple of weeks ago. So I, I don't know. I, I like that I'm, feels like I'm learning a bit more. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So it feels like mm, thinking that the data generation process is, is on, it ha has its own distribution. It's not always going to be the same data generation process. Um, I, I don't think I've, follow that also could just be me that me not following i don't know if ron or ryan you followed that um just what you were talking about that the parameters have their distribution and there's also like a sampling distribution like i'm just getting all that oh, in my head yes yeah. yeah so it's like i guess right with frequentist statistics we don't really we just think of them as you know like a normal distribution right as two parameters as mu and you know standard deviation, sigma, you know, sigma squared, the variance. Um, and, but those are like always like set. They're just like, here is the value. Whereas my understanding, right, with when we're applying priors is that we're applying priors on those parameters and we're allowing them to vary, right? Um, given, and right, you, know, you put priors on that, you observe some data and you update those parameters, um, which is different than what distribution your data follows. Um, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. to me never really sunk in again until two weeks ago. I'm like, oh, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Even if I'm like, doing the computations correctly, it's like, okay. Yeah, I wonder if that's because from a frequentist point of view, you never think about distributions of your parameters. You're not really allowed to. Yeah. Allowed, you're almost yeah. not allowed to talk about that, right? <laughs> Whereas yeah, you're, no, you're just you're like, this is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, you know, I just like, here, here's the mean, here's like the variance. This is, this is what it is. Whereas like, right, the, when we're applying priors, we're applying priors to the parameters themselves, um, which I think is, you know, obviously very interesting, right? And then you like, I don't know, even like take this, right, in Stan. Um, at least my the, how I look at it is right. Our, our data y follows a binomial distribution with um, n equals one hundred, our number of samples, and a probability pi. Um, but pi itself follows a beta distribution um, that we've assigned a prior of four and six. Um, right, we're, we're it's it's very vague prior, um, maybe not very vague, but it's a vague prior. Um, it's less than 0. 0.5. Um, and obviously then we observe some data and then we update that, right? And then that's fed into, um, fed into, you know, the binomial bit, um, which what our data actually follows, um, which, yeah, I think it made more sense when I was actually like writing out the stand code about what is actually happening, which I don't know, I, I, I like that, um, that things fall into more, fall into place. More yeah. Time, you know, as we've gone through. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess that's my takeaway from, this session about the idea of two distributions and I and I think that's a big thing moving from 
frequencies to Beijing that you have to wrap your head around. So I, I'm Definitely. understanding it more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so I, yeah, I don't have too much more. So we're just gonna run through it. Um, so this is you know from the book where it's gonna combine all of the chains and we're gonna create those predictions. Um, so our binome is you know random deviates from a binomial distribution. Um, in this case, pi, I think it's like 20,000. Um, we're saying that we want to compute 20 trials, right? Because we, you know, observing a sample of data and our probability pi, which comes from um, the Markov chains, right? That we created above. Um, so what that looks like is that our predictions are, um, you know, we're saying two people will be, um, you know, for like this first, iteration, right? We're, we're saying that our prediction is two, um, number of Gen X, number of MoMA artists that are Gen Xers or younger, or three and five, but obviously you don't want to look at that because that's just a table. So we can plot it, right? And we can then see that um, the most likely um, outcome, right? Given what, from our, what we made with the Markov chain Monte Carlo is three, and that's like right what we're going to predict. But it, again, that prediction can like reasonably range from zero to 10, you know, obviously there's a few more over here, right? So like 13, um, but this is our predictions, right? Most likely three, but um, getting a reasonably range from zero to like 10, um, which is again, cool, right? Like, but this is before we've even observed uh, a sample of data, right? We already have um, some idea of what that distribution could look like, which I think is like, you know, pretty cool. Right, um, gives you know more insights depending on like what application you're using. Gives you like more insight about like what that data could look like prior to observing it, which I think is nice. Um, the last bit, and then I'll stop sharing my screen, and then I'll go to the book. And we can talk about some exercises. Um, the chapter ends with uh, the benefits of Bayesian, you know, Bayesian statistics. My main takeaway is that we just get um, a more intuitive interpretation of parameters. Right, um, I, I had said at the beginning that confidence intervals, everyone actually interprets them how, uh, what a Bayesian credible interval is, right? Um, so it's, it is nice to you know, know that a lot of the things that we're doing in Bayesian statistics have like a very intuitive interpretation, even if sometimes the math can be very dense, right? Um, we don't have to worry about necessarily p-values, which are historically, <laughs> no one knows what that is, knows what they are, can properly define them. Um, so I think that's like the big, that's like the big benefit, right, of um, Bayesian statistics that, you know, we get these intuitive interpretations of like data and parameters. Um, this, you know, I think it's definitely a benefit. Um, I, think, I think, think especially if you, you know, you're trying to convince like maybe stakeholders about things it's like, here's a really intuitive interpretation of like, what it is I'm doing, right? I'll have to like talk about like the long run stuff, like frequency statistics. Um, but yeah, that's all I have. I'm just going to stop sharing real quick. Um, I'm going to go to the book. We can, you know, look at a couple exercises. But do any of you have any questions, comments? This is great. Cool. Um, here, yeah, let's go to the book. Uh, let's pick a few. So I mean, we still have some time. Yeah. Obviously. So yeah, I'll just pick a few and no chat. <laughs> uh, let's see what what do I need to be sharing. I need to be sharing this. Okay. Um. So yeah, I I'll be honest. A long week at work, so I haven't really looked at these a ton. Um. So I kind of just skimmed through a few. But um. Where do, you know what I don't know. Let's start with warming up. <laughs> um. So uh. 8.2 is just a conceptual exercise. Uh, so in estimating some parameter lambda, uh, what are some drawbacks to only reporting the central tendency of the lambda posterior model? If anyone would like to go at that, you know, <laughs> questions to you guys. I mean, I guess if you're only looking at central tendency, you're assuming that like there's no variability, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I would say too. Yeah, because I think I mean, it's like that. Oh yeah, here did me cut you off. I was gonna say that you know basically like in the book they gave an example where okay if I you know you took one survey and I did one survey but my survey was more you know a lot more 
uh, respondents, I would have a lot more, a lot less uncertainty on my answer. But if we just only answer, answer the central uh, tendency, we both, you know, there's no, there's no way to know that my, my number is more certain than your number, for example, right? Yeah. In, in physics, we always say never, ever report a number without some kind of error bars on it, right? It right. makes no sense just to say, oh, I measured this, it's 3.7 meters. Like, that's a wrong answer, you know, that you get marked wrong for that, even if it was, because <laughs> it can't be right. It wasn't exactly 3.7 meters with no error, so you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's kind of interesting that you think like so many applications, like, I don't know, let's say like ML or stuff, it's just like, here's a number, but it's like, it's always right uncertainty and those predictions, which I find, I don't know, this where my brain went. <laughs> no, that's uh, a great observation because I've noticed in machine learning, particularly uh, with neural net stuff, a lot of times they do just come out with single numbers, but the trend of that is changing. There's something Bayesian neural networks, which I don't know even much about at all, but the idea is to try to include these uncertainties in your um, in your neural networks. And yeah. they actually do some kind of Bayesian uncertainties on the weights and everything. Oh, that's cool. Uh, that's probably not the right terminology, but there is this is a thing I want to, this is a thing I want to learn about in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that actually sounds really interesting. Huh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that was the same thing, Ron, Ron, you, you said the same exact thing I was going to say. So cool. Oh, uh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's it like the, the thing about, yeah, <laughs> it was like the thing at the start of the book where it's like, oh yeah, the distributions are different. Even the central tendency is the same. Um, next one is, so you, we have a uh, 95% credit. So the 95% credible interval for Lambda is uh, between one and 3.4. How do you interpret this? Yeah, you talked about this because I think you said something like, you know, the way that we should um, interpret confidence intervals should be like, you know, 95 out of, you know, 100 times if we were to, to replicate this experiment, we would contain the actual parameter. But, and then I think you said something like the, 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 credi the credible interval means that there's a 95% chance that um, the parameter is within, um, the, the interval is not the same thing though. I mean, I, I don't, I'm actually not sure. Yeah. Cause it's, so it's my understanding, right. With like the frequentist confidence interval is that it's not mm. that it's like, I calculate some confidence interval, right. On some sample of data and write like the computations there. And it's like, let's say it's between one and three, let's say, let's say the parameters mu. My understanding is that it's not that there's a 95%. We are 95% confident that, mu is between one and three. It's more that there is a, we are 95% confident that mu is, we're, we're like, mu will be contained in a confidence interval like 95 out of a hundred times if you were to like rerun it or with different samples of data, which has always been like, and I'm kind of butchering that I know, but it's always like been a weird, way of like you know you compute a confidence interval but like the interpretation is not intuitive whereas like the credible interval um is like an intuitive one right so like for this example i would say that um we are 95 percent sure that lambda is between one and 3.4 um which in the frequentist perspective is that it's not this interval it's 95 out of 100 intervals would contain the true parameter lambda which like, I find a little weird personally. <laughs> so you, I just posted a link in chat to this book I've been reading. I just, I'm not that far through it, but it's called Bernoulli's Fallacy. It's a recent book that just came out. It's all about like Bayesian and uh, versus frequentist kind of thing, pro Bayesian, but it's really interesting so far. It talks a lot about this exact issue of like turning the thing upside down, you know, how all this, for a long time, since Bernoulli, I guess, people have always thought of it the other way around. Like, oh, this, what, what I mean is if I repeat this experiment, I, and the, if the true value was the value I measured, right? And then I repeat this experiment, I would expect to find a value close to what I measured this many, with this probability or something, right? That's kind of the frequentist approach, whereas the Bayesian approach is, no, this, what I'm determining is, what is the true value and what is the uncertainty in my belief in what that true value is? And it is almost like you gotta use the word belief because it's like, this is my, belief range of this the true value of the parameter so it's a very interesting book anyway yeah no yeah but yeah i guess it's like uh, you know, what so i'm you saying I, I guess what i'm saying by posting a book here is 
this it's a very deep thing <laughs> it's yeah. not just it's a lot to no think yeah about. no no definitely <laughs> and it's like no definitely because yeah. it's like because i think even like in my intro dance class it's always just been like this is how i predict like I, I forgot who professor is like no it's actually like the long run right like that's how you think about it and i'm like yeah. but if let's say even let's say in a practical setting right like you calculate a confidence interval for some parameter and you're like presenting that to stakeholders I, I'm not going to tell them like, oh yeah, you know, if we just like the long run, like they'd be like, but what does that mean? Right. It's like, yeah. it's kind of a bit mm -hmm. weirder. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know like people have definitely like explained that, right. Like what a confidence interval is to stakeholders, like that has definitely been a thing, but it's definitely to me at least a lot less intuitive how you would approach that compared to like a credible interval where it's like, here's the range. And like, I'm 95% confident that this parameters yes. between yeah. these bounds. That's um, yeah, the Bayesian approach seems so much more intuitive. And, and what's important, I think, and this book talks about this, a lot of people will flip the script, even though you don't mean to. If you use a frequentist method and you method, you report this, you know, uh bounds, you know, this uh whatever you call it, the you, you know, basic co confidence interval, not a credible, but a confidence interval and a frequentist approach, a lot of people will internally in their mind just flip that into a credible interval anyway. Even though that's not what it is, so yeah, <laughs> that's also true. Yeah, especially um, stakeholders who don't really know statistics, right? Yeah, you may say all these words like, "Oh, yeah, that means we think that this parameter is between here and there." Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, I see you raised your, see you raised your hand. Uh, cool yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I'm a scientist. I'm trying to find, I don't know, the mean height of my bounds, and this is. And I don't know if I'm probably butchering it somehow, but I get this confidence interval that my uh, credible interval that the mean height of my plants is between one and 3.4, which is very high. So it doesn't mean that like it's very wide. Yeah. Doesn't mean as a scientist, I go back and do my experiment and then try and use like a better ruler to like measure the height of my plants to end up getting a smaller, credible interval like what does it or there's nothing you can do to really shrink the credible interval or i don't know like this oh, is how no. i'm thinking oh. about it but but i, I yes. don't know if you definitely can do more experiments and shrink that credible interval. every time you do a shrink every time you do more uh, experiments you update your posterior with yeah. the data you learned and your previous posterior becomes your new prior for that next experiment set too yeah so like you can get increased, right? We observe more data, right? And then because, right, there is a relationship between um, right or prior or likelihood, all that, um, or right, the posterior is proportional to the prior times likelihood. Um, yeah, this is, if, uh, go back, you go back and look at section chapter 4.4, it kind of talks about this, uh, this aspect yeah. of the- It's like what's called, like, okay. things like, yeah, sequential or like they call it Bayesian learning, right? Um, so like, yeah, you can definitely actually like shrink that range, right? Cause like, yeah, I think you bring up a good point too. It's like, well, yeah, I'm 95% confident in a very wide range of things. It's like, what is that net? Like, okay. Um, but right, if we, let's say observe more data, we can then obviously, we would shrink um, the bounds, right? Of our posterior distribution, right? If we observe more data, um, our posterior would look a lot more like the likelihood. Um, Right, so that is like one way, right? Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. you can kind of do that. Or you can say that, um, I guess they also the more, I wouldn't say like naive way or just like, I can't really think of the word easy. Easy is not the word, but I'm gonna use it. Um, is like, you know, I could use a different credible level, right? I'd be like, I'm 80% confident that it, that like my parameter of interest is between this and that. And it would obviously be um, more narrow right to your range but obviously you're less mm -hmm, confident mm -hmm. as a result so that's obviously a trade-off as well i think it all depends on what it is that you're looking at and like yeah really it just i think it mostly depends on like what it is that you're looking at and like what level of like very confidence like going yeah to, yeah all that okay. um thank, thank you yeah uh Any of these interest you guys? Three to five. Um, I think someone mentioned the climate one. Well, oh, that's right. a, yeah. The, yeah, the climate that's, one's um, actually a, a work. You have to sit down and work through it with the uh, oh, okay. and everything. So 
So oh, that's okay. more something to do. But oh, that's something to do on your own. And then, by the way, if you're doing that, you run into trouble with it, feel free to post, you know, start a thread on the Slack and people hope can jump in. Yeah. Um, what yeah, about what you. about what about eight point three? I mean, the hypothesis testing thing. Sure. Interesting, right? Yeah. Um, so let's see. In each situation below, indicate whether the issue at hand could be addressed using a hypothesis test. So the first one is your friend Trishel um, claims that more than forty percent of dogs at the dog park do not have a dog license. So is this? I guess. Let's do it like this. Do you think it could be addressed by a hypothesis test? And if so, how do you construct it? Any takers? <laughs> so you do a hypothesis test without actually like doing a survey, like, or you do the survey, then you do the hypothesis test, or so this is just asking, um, can you, like given this question, right, that like the situation, can you form a hypothesis test on that? So this is like oh, yeah, before yeah. observing any data, right? This is just so like, like, yeah, you, you can. You could say that, um, could you show your screen where you had the hypothesis test I did so I can just try? Oh, yeah. yeah. Let me, um, most. Okay, so, so the only annoying part like, about having an ultra wide monitor is that screen sharing is infuriating. <laughs> um, so the question is that 40% of dogs do not have a dog license. Yeah. Right? Um, okay, actually, so. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, your friend Rochelle claims that more than 40% of dogs at the dark park do not have a dog license. Yeah. So. You could say that um, more than 40% do not have. Uh, so you have, are you still going to do it for pi? Is pi is for the parameter or? So I mean, it could be like, like anything, right? Like it could just be, it could okay. be A, B, Q. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever you want to name that. Okay, so. It could be A um, is greater than uh, 0 0.4, something like that. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, what, what was it again? So it's, you know what? I, I should just copy this question. Let's just copy all of them here because why am I going to keep going back and forth? Um, you and I. Sorry, one sec. No, I want this. Okay, let's copy all this. And let's just do. So she let's thinks that she, she thinks that more, more than 40% do not have a dog license. So it could be that. Um, what you are going to test is that the true value, the true percentage of dogs that have a, a dog license is less than 40, 0 0.4. You're saying less than 0 0.4, so it's great. It claims that more than 40. So we are testing just exactly yeah. what she says. Yeah, no, okay. no, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so the null, right, that would be, um, Let's just, you said it was A, right? That was you were calling it. So like A is um, or null is that it's less than um, 0.40. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because so it's saying your friend Trishel claims that more than 40%. So she's saying it has to be more. Um, uh -huh. or actually rather it should be less than equal, right? Um, because if it's at least my interpretation, and again, if any Ron you want to jump in or Ama you want to correct me as well. Um, my thing, my thinking is why it'd be less than or equal to is because she's claiming that it's more than forty, right? So if it's forty, mm -hmm. it would that still, should be in the no. Yeah, so that's why I'm doing less than or equal to. And then what do you think mm -hmm. the alternative hypothesis would be? Okay, so that the true percentage of dogs that have that 
do not have a dog license is greater than 40, 0 0.4. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I think what's confusing is just the, um, you're thinking like the one side test, like greater than or less than, and then you're like, oh wait, do not have a dog license. That I, I don't know, that was tripping me up a little bit. Just like, okay. So um, this is one-sided because we've specifically said it was like equal to 40% and that will be two-sided. Um, yeah, so I guess like for the alternative, right? It would be, if she said, um, your friend Shell claims that um, like it's like it's not 40%, right? Yeah. Um, then it would just be that it just doesn't equal 0 0.4, yeah. right? Um, so that, and then that it doesn't be matter what step. direction. Yeah, it doesn't matter what direction, right, it is. In this case, since she's claiming that it's more than 40%, right, she's saying that, you know, that's where I think that like, that's my belief, right? Um, and that's, we're looking at one side of the distribution. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Next, yeah. So next one is um, your professor is interested in learning about the proportion of students at a large university who have heard of Bayesian statistics. Um, this one I say no because, like, from what we just did in the first one, you have to have like a value that you test, and he just yeah. hasn't given a value. Yeah, I guess it's like one of those where like. You could, right? Like you could totally formulate that. Like if, like what you're saying, um, mm -hmm. you were to like present a value, but I would say mm -hmm. as it is presented that, I'm just gonna put, you know, no, <laughs> with an exclamation. Yeah, um, I, mean, I would say this is posterior estimation. You're gonna wanna like give a distribution at the end of what the, um, what the, what the proportion is, right? Just to be, yeah. after you do your survey, you'll give them some distribution, you'll estimate the mean, you'll give them the confidence, uh, credible interval, that kind of thing. Yep. So it goes no, in that posterior estimation category. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, so I think what we have two more, awesome. And I think, you know, we'll end for today. Yeah, that um, works. So yeah. then an environmental justice advocate wants to know if more than 60% of voters in their state support a new regulation. So do we think that this could be formed as a hypothesis test? Yes, I'm updating my information from question one. <laughs> yeah, I think so, it's, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's literally just, yeah, it's the same so thing. It's a, it's like, it's, it's more, so it's just, oh, I can't write, um, that's they're equal to write 0.6, and then our, uh, our alternative is, um, greater than 0 0.6. Yay. <laughs> awesome. Not too bad. Uh, last one. So it's D. And uh, so Sarah is studying Tomley Syntaxis Mathematica text and wants to investigate the number of times that Tomley uses a certain mode of argument per page of text. Okay. Uh, based on Tomley's other writings, she think it will be, she thinks it will be about three times per page. Rather than reading all 13 volumes of wow, Syntaxis wow, Mathematica, um, Sarah takes a random sample. the next sample book club. Of, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sarah takes a random sample of 90 pages. Okay. Um, I want to say no, Same. but I'm not insanely confident about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're um, make, by throwing numbers in there, they're trying to make you think, oh, she's is it a hypothesis something to do with three times her page, but it's not. That's more yeah. about her prior. That's your prior, right? That's her prior, so, right? And then she takes a sample, right, yeah. of data. So like I have some prior, right? Yeah. So I would say that this also isn't, but then obviously you could form it, right, after observing right you observe some data you have to do prior to a posterior so yeah. yeah i think it's this one's just like it's intentionally a mouthful right and then like you're saying like there's numbers so maybe <laughs> but yeah i i agree i think like this one you wouldn't um because i think what you're saying ron right like this is this is her prior right to sarah's prior it's about three times per page and you know 
I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to read 13 volumes of this. So I'm going to take a sample, a random sample of 90 pages um, and then see what that looks like. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. But we'll just say no um, as well for that. Um, but cool. Um, I think this was, this is helpful. Um, this was, this was a good presentation. Again, my apologies for not making it look as snazzy as I wanted to, but I, I No, I was, very yeah. much appreciate you uh, lowering the expectations for when I present next week. <laughs> <laughs> no, I always love how yours thinks like, right, the book down, no. I was just like, I was doing this morning, I'm like, oh my God, it's like I have other sh like stuff at work and I'm like this and I'm like, I'm, okay. I'm still gonna uh, use book down just because I'm not confident with Quarto yet. Um, yeah, I wanna get it, there, but I just haven't had a chance. Yeah, I need to look back a little bit more. Um, but yeah, cool. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, I definitely yeah. think it's more stuff for sinking into my brain. Amma, it's great for you to join. Um, yeah, no, no. Amma, have you, you read up on the rest of the chapters already then? you're. Um, it, it's weird. Because I feel like when, so when someone is teaching you something, they always leave something out. So I'm using two books. I'm using the puppy book, right? Is that what you called it? Oh, I like the puppy book, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm using the puppy book and I'm using this book and I'm like, I'm trying to find my way <laughs> through the sea of Beijing and yeah. Yeah, no, okay, I, you're, you're the same page we're on then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I, I actually, I really like that too. Cause it's like, I think for a lot of my undergrads, always like trying to find like, you know, people like the one book, right? The one book on some subject, mm -hmm. right? This is how, like, but you actually, I, I agree. It's like, it's like these fields are like, they're massive, right? So you're, uh, you're ostensibly going to leave stuff out, right? Just cause like, you mm -hmm. can't cover everything. Um, so I was even thinking about it. Cause I, I work, I have to use more Python and mm -hmm. better or worse. I'm actually liking Python a bit more. <laughs> um, but, um, there is a, um, Python book it's called, I think it's like Python. It's like, Bayes, it's a Bayesian computation book written by some of the, uh, developers of this one Bayesian framework called oh, PyMC. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, I, I was like, that book too. I, I was thinking of just like, you know, reading the first chapter. And if I like it, just getting like a hard copy. Cause I agree. Like sometimes it's all right. Authors focus on like different parts yeah. of stuff it, and it's uh, not just one book. Message me later about that because um, uh, that about that book because I there's he wrote two books that guy, um, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering which one you're actually looking at. But <laughs> I could actually um here I could just let me do so I was really just looking at it. Yeah. and because I'm I'm such a beginner, sometimes the way someone introduces things because I feel like the puppy book can be very like technical <laughs> in a way so it's like this one i think my first book i used was i don't know if you've heard of it signal not noise so it's more of like a narrative but he he talks about vision but it's really like a narrative like it's a story it. yeah well i've heard i i've also heard that um statistical rethinking is good it's um, very good yeah and that, that one I also that book is well. really good. They used to do the book club on that book instead of this one, but that book has a disadvantage of not being free, the statistical rethinking, I guess. So yeah, mm -hmm. but it's really good, and people have translated it into Python as well. Um, the, actually, the, yeah. the exercises actually, I did see that. Um, so I don't know. I part of me is always just like I should do a bit more Python, just sometimes I find R like. I don't know why. Sometimes I find like I reread re my R code. I'm like, what's I write it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's like whereas I'm like python it's like sometimes i get annoyed to like write it but then i'm like i read it i'm like oh that's why i wrote okay, cool okay. yeah <laughs> i agree you know? um and also it's like at work too so like sometimes you're like well here we are um but yeah i, I posted the link uh the ron so that's that was the book yeah i, was I, I do have that um, book i haven't really worked through it i, I worked he wrote like you said wrote two books and I actually worked through his previous book which i think was published by packet or something got um, it mm. And that book's not too bad. I hope this book is actually better. Oh, is though. it? Is it? Um, <laughs> I guess we have a minute, but I think it's like it's like Bayesian analysis and like Python. Yeah, you said it was packed. Like, oh yeah, it, nope. I was literally also looking at this book too. So I figured like sometime. Yeah, same author. Yeah. Uh, this one mm -hmm. I think is a bit more uh, technical. I'd say like a bit more of the math, right? So I'd say it's probably a bit more advanced, which I know I've been struggle with, but you know. Yeah, uh, but I, th I think the other book that you're talking about is a bit more introductory. Yes, um, that's right. It is. Yeah. So I, 
I did work through most of that book or some, I forget now, which I, I skipped around in that book a little bit with the intent of like, oh, I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to come into this, um, this, the new book, the newer book that he had just, this other book you're talking about, the one he posted just came out recently. Um, yeah. Pretty new. And so mm -hmm. I think now though, this class will be a great stepping stone into, or now even you could probably start working through this, um, the book you posted because yeah. you start doing the Phi MC3 stuff. It, it is a little different because you have to use that RBs thing and everything and get used to all that. And then it's quite a bit. I found it some of it a little bit with using Pi MC3, a little bit tricky or Pi MC, I guess they're calling it now, no three. Uh, yeah. Pi MC because of the fact you have to use this RBs thing, which involves yet another type of data called X data mm -hmm. or something like that. It's like, yeah, oh, man. X arrays, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I don't know. So, sometimes I think like I was even playing with Pi MC a little bit the other day. I'm like, oh, this actually, I like this. I don't know. It, it, feel, it feels like better than to write write something in stand and have it like a pile. But full but, disclosure, when I'm doing the exercises for this cl this class, I'm using Pi MC. I'm, I'm using Pi MC. Sometimes I'm using Pi Stan. I'm using Python mostly though. So next yeah. week when I give you a presentation, I'm going to have to go back and do everything in R. So it's, it's a good exercise. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, I haven't actually been using R Stan doing these exercises. I've been using Python. <laughs> <laughs> um but cool yeah well guys it was great um, yeah good job yeah yeah you, thanks so much oh, it was great yeah great to again meet you yeah. and happy you're here yeah see thank you, you. Next time. Awesome. Yeah. Take, see, see you guys bye